So I'm Sophie Quinn Judge. Uh, I worked for the American Friends Service Committee in Vietnam and did some speaking afterwards. And uh, since then, I've become a PhD at the age of 51. I, um, so I stuck with the Vietnamese theme all these years, which is pretty funny. So I thought today, um, you know, we're here to celebrate and to draw lessons of Vietnam. So I thought that we could do a bit of each today, um, tell some of the old stories um, about educating the American public about the war in Vietnam, um, talk about what seemed to really click, um, what might have been done better, but um, think about ways that we can pass on some of the stuff that we learned as researchers and educators in those years. Um, I think that we all felt pretty good in the end when the war ended. Um, but I'm just wondering if, if um, the generations coming along um, know what all the models were that were used, what's possible, um, and you know, what, what really makes people prick up their ears and notice. Okay, so why don't we do introductions quickly, um, not too long, just names and affiliations. And then um, I will just open it up for people to tell their stories. Uh, I'm Matt Turner. I work with the Indochina Mobile Education Fund. Uh, Pat Turner, I just adjunct work in this line of that a little bit, and this and that. I'm Patrick Hiller. I work as the director for the War Prevention Initiative in Portland, Oregon, and I teach conflict resolution at Portland State University. Dan Rafferty, I'm with an energy company that's looking at doing some hydro, some uh, non-environmental preventionist type hydro in, in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. We're in New York City, Burden Power. My name is Rob Cunningham. I'm from Washington. I do health policy research now, but back in the day I was at, I worked at Ramparts and worked for the guy that Ron Downs mentioned, Bob Shearer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I, I came to the workshop wondering if other people share some of the misgivings I have after the fact about the way we tailored our research to our, our um, preferred conclusions and um, uh, um, fell into a certain amount of, uh, um, I don't know what you could say, uh, um, orthodoxy. There's a conflict with the basic purpose of research. Up a little bit more. The conflict between the orthodoxies that settled in on us at times and, and what real research is, which is an open minded inquiry. Yeah, Jane Barton, I work with the American Friends Service Committee um, in the U.S. and Vietnam for three years. I'm Earl Martin. Um, I lived and worked in. Vietnam five years during the war with Mennonite Central Committee, uh, stayed in Vietnam after the end of the war for some months, um, did some writing about that period of time, um, and have done quite a bit of speaking uh, across the U.S. about Vietnam to student groups and churches and uh, <coughs> so forth, and still do some of that. Let's jump back to Art Canagas. We're just doing quick introductions. As we okay, well, I'm uh, Arthur Canagas. I uh, was part of the Narmic Collective, producing the automated air war and sharing global resources, uh, the uh, um, post-war war and so on. That's how I got my start in my documentary career. I went on to uh, produce Paul with, with the Center for Defense Information, the Paul Newman film, War Without Winners. And, uh, and now I've just completed my latest film, The World is My Country. Some of you might have seen the little flyer about it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a new film about not just what we're, you know, what are we against, but what are we for? How it's a, this guy, Gary Davis, an incredible vision of how we can create, uh, how we become citizens of the world, and we the people can create a way to, uh, to govern our world. So uh, I invite everybody to come. The showing is tomorrow. I've got my start at AFSC, and uh, the showing tomorrow is at the AFSC offices just 10 minutes away from here at Davis House. Uh, at 1 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, Robbie Newton, and I'm a scientist in New York. I study oceans and climate. <coughs> um, Howie Shordloff, uh, 
Robbie and I were high school activists <laughs> back in New York City in the uh, late 60s, uh, involved in the anti-war movement, being Fifth Avenue Vietnam Peace Parade Committee, and high school mobilization, tend to war, and um, now I'm, uh, after I retired from a, 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 a straight job for, for after 30 years, I'm a part-time instructor of <laughs> history and, uh, and writing in New York City. I'm Janet Goldwasser, originally from New York City, uh, for the last uh, 50 some years in Michigan. And uh, back in the day, uh, and I'm a retired electrical engineer now, which was all post 60s. Uh, back in the day, worked uh, full time at the Radical Education Project in Ann Arbor, which served as publishing our yeah. season last. Uh, got some of you some of our pamphlets. Okay. David Elliott, uh, retired from Pomona College in California. And you just say something about your studies quickly? Um, and they have written a couple of books on. A very modest in speaking that way. I'm Linda Yar. I'm at George Washington University now and also on the board of directors of Critical Asian Studies, which is the successor to the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Studies, scholars. I'm um, Maya Elliott, I'm uh, a writer and I've written a couple books on Vietnam. Uh, my name is Jeff Hearn. Um, I was just graduating from high school in 1975, so I sort of came of age, you know, in the wake of what all we were doing. Went off to college and tried to learn everything I could about um, the student movement, the anti-war movement, um, and I now live in in the D.C. area where I'm going to be working um, to try and get Jamie Raskin elected to Congress, uh, mm -hmm. Martin, Marcus Raskin's son. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, my name is Dylan. Uh, I, uh, I'm from Louisiana, and I'm in D.C. currently as an organizer. I mainly work with the environmental movement. I'm currently helping uh, uh, D.C. vote uh, create a canvas to help move towards statehood. Okay. Um, my name is Adriana Crespo. I'm a visual communication designer for the Pan American Health Organization, and I'm just very interested in political action and the grassroots organizing. Well, Hanson, uh, years ago, I worked with Arthur at NARC. <coughs> Stefan Ostrak, I'm also a veteran of NARMIC uh, at a later stage than you, because I don't remember you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, uh, I mean, I think the great thing about NARMIC, which was National Action Research on the Military Industrial Complex, for those who don't know, was the concept of action research and the fact that we were do, we were doing stuff and, and researching and, and, and producing stuff for active campaigns, um, and so it was very um, very much action oriented. I think the other great thing about it, at least when I was there, was that we really operated as a collective and everybody read every read and edited everything that any that any of us wrote. So it was a really collective effort and. Among other things, I think that made me a much better writer and editor. Um, and then I went on to a career as a union representative and negotiator after uh, that period. Of time. I, I, uh, my name is Murray Hebert. I was a um, uh, Mennonite Central Committee volunteer for the end of the war in Vietnam, and then later was in Laos when the war ended. I later covered Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia as a journalist in the late 80s and early 90s, and I, I now work at a think tank uh, called uh, CSIS here in Washington. We work on the, on the countries of Southeast Asia, including their relations with the U.S. My name is Marie Reiser. I'm really here just as a, as a student. I came to this session because I'm interested in the role of research and education to make good arguments. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really lucky to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm Martin Chandler. I was involved in the anti-war movement in the 60s. I was president of SDS in Madison. Um, and uh, then taught junior high school in Harlem for three years. <coughs> then went into a business career, which I still kind of do, in fashion, international textiles, all that kind of stuff. And I've been involved in urban education and environmental stuff. I was on the board of Rainfall Alliance for 17 years. And uh, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Wayne Joyce. I'm a, uh, a Detroit lifer. 
uh, and involved in many activities and social movements there all my life. Uh, I'm now mostly uh, a writer. Uh, I retired 10 years ago as the communications director for the United Auto Workers Union. Uh, and I just uh, finished co-editing a book, uh, which will be out in September, which is largely about the citizen's diplomacy aspect of the anti-war movement, uh, and which includes chapters from uh, many people whose names you'll recognize, and yeah, if you want to pass these around, that'd be great. I'm Molly Post, I'm married to Arthur Fangas, and uh, I've been in Mexico, and I'm involved in scholarship and water in our local area. Excuse me, question. Um, people want to introduce yourselves, or are you... Um, just bystanders. We'd like to know who you are, I guess. I'm not a press person. I just look like one. <laughs> well, I take pictures to elect progressives and Democrats, and I post them on a Flickr page. My username is Maryland Friend of Hillary, MD Friend of Hillary, and right now I'm working on Jenny Raskin's campaign, but I was involved a little bit. for Congressman Alex Lowenstein's Project Rolling Thunder, which is allegedly nonpartisan, teaching against the war. So I'm not part of that. Anyway. Okay. Um, I'm trying to I'm gonna leave here because I'm gonna try to take pictures of all the rest of them. <laughs> okay. Thanks for dropping by. Okay, um, I don't know how we want to I don't think we need to organize this very much. There are not too many of us, so uh, if anybody wants to start off with their story about how you got involved in research and action against the war, that would be great. Uh, okay, well, I'll, Arthur, I just want to say that um, I had been sort of an a anti-war protester for a while before I worked for AFSC. But I remember I was living in Paris when I first saw the slideshow, The Automated Battlefield, that was put together by Arthur's organization, NARMIC. And um, it just um, sort of woke up my brain a little bit. And, and um, it showed me that if you put together the story in a convincing, compelling way, um, nobody could, could fail to be affected um, or influenced by a good piece of information. So yeah, say more. <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting the way we did that. This collective thing we were talking about, it was a real marriage of research and uh, outreach. So, for instance, we made this slideshow which simplified things to communicate to anybody, but we had like an inch thick documentation that went with it of all the facts, figures, and details. So the researchers and the presenters kind of came together to create this. Uh, but the other thing I think that, that Narmik did that I keep wishing we were doing, the company was doing now with the current wars, is that in, in terms of research and action, we put together, we, we got to, in, in order to run this whole military industrial complex, they've got to have all this stuff published somewhere because all the contractors need to get it. So we got all, the, we got DMS and all these publications that were used by the military contractors to get contracts to build these little bomblets and build the anti-personnel weapons and all these things. And then we identified, you know, which are the companies that have this and which are their consumer products. And then we got stuff out to local <coughs> projects, like the Honeywell Project, mm -hmm. where there these vomits are being made, so they're finding out, okay, my factory right here is making these. Or, or at Earlham, where I went to college, they're at Avco, nine blocks away. They were making out of first, they were making the only person of flechettes that would spin around and tear into your body and rip, up, rip holes in them. And one of their board members at Avco, when they saw Avco's presentation, I threw up on the spot just seeing the, the, the tear this thing did. And, uh, and so this, this combination, I mean, now more than ever, corporations are dominating our world, you know, and they're very vulnerable. They have consumer products and so on. And I think that I would love to see us get sparked that in the new, in, in, in the ongoing <coughs> anti-war movement, we had something like Narmic letting all these local groups join right there in your community. There's this factory that's doing this. You think they're part of it. Like Avco would contribute to Earlham and, oh, they're a wonderful company. <coughs> but look what they're really doing. And you know, I think that kind of research and unmasking, uh, taken down to the local level, uh, can really empower local groups who feel so hopeless on the global level. But right here in our community, this is happening. We can do something. Um, Would it say something about the noble education? Yeah, exactly. Um, I had 
Yeah, very, I'll try to be very brief, but um, I had worked on a number of demonstrations, the biggest one being the April 24th demonstration, and when that was over, I felt like, uh, watching the evening news, I had the sense that the anti-war movement needed to stop having demonstrations in Washington and start working in local communities and, and outreach and educating the public. And I had the good fortune to stumble into the right people at the right time. I don't get, I mean, it was just luck. But I met Don Luce, who was, uh, had been in Vietnam as the head of international voluntary services, sort of a private Peace Corps, if you're not familiar with that. And he led IDS to decide to close down their mission in Vietnam and because they were being used for public relations by the military and the news media to create the appearance that America was building schools and, and providing physical therapy for people in Vietnam. Don wanted to educate the people in the United States about what Vietnam, what was really happening in Vietnam and who the Vietnamese people were on a humanitarian level, on a very grassroots level. And so we, we built uh, panel exhibits, bought vans, we had two vans, and we, in each van we carried 24 by 8 foot panels that could be stood up on legs and connected and set up in a typical uh, school or mall. And the exhibit was accompanied, and this was photo exhibits with a little bit of text. And we carried a collection of books, including David, some books, I remember David Elliott's book was one. Uh, and the staff that ran the exhibit uh, were generally a couple, two people, uh, it's curious. I don't think you, I don't think Earl Martin that you did it, but you came real close. You, you I, you know, I was within the China Resource Center at the time, so we shared an office. Yeah. And, but we uh, had this odd situation of people who'd been in Vietnam wanted to, you know, were upset about what they saw, and we provided the vehicle, or Don provided the vehicle through which they could go to a small town in Louisiana and set up a program, and we were, it, typically a program would be three days, and we provided, we had films that we carried, we had books, we would speak at radio stations, get interviewed by the local newspaper, and set up a Vietnamese meal, which was a huge success with uh, people in the church coming. It, it plugged into a, an infrastructure that already existed in a lot of communities, where there were anti-war people who wanted to do something, but they felt helpless and they couldn't afford to fly to Washington. I try to leap forward to today, and with the internet, I don't know that you need to buy Volkswagen buses and pack them full of <laughs> exhibits and, and all of that difficulty, although the photo exhibit, and I still have photos from that exhibit, are heart-wrenching. Um, but I would think that something similar could be done that could be very effective. And I, it, to me, it's, it's a model with a focus on not trying to do things on a national level, but trying to do things on a local level. So, and it could certainly be done right now. I mean, I look at what's going on in Baltimore, and, and I wish someone would work on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that is really different is that, I mean, as you say, just the, the effort to diffuse information is so different, right? I mean, we had to make long distance phone calls, which were really expensive. We had to fold things up and mail them. I mean, I was a printer at Liberation News Service, right? And, right? You had to, I mean, this is something the entire infrastructure would be a laptop now. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, it's a real different, we put a lot of energy into simply physically moving the information right. from the people in this room down to the people you know, we were trying to organize. And I think that's not much of an issue now. The information is bizarrely available, but the, the, the capacity of people to integrate that into their consciousness and be active is as you know, whatever, that the inertia is as great or greater than it was at the time, you know, when we were, when we were working around Vietnam. 
But what I loved about it, the mobile education project was the providing food, <coughs> getting people to come into a church hall and sit down and prepare and enjoy a Vietnamese meal. And that gave them a sense that there's more to Vietnam than just wars and bombs. And, and, and in some Tell them way, we're people. I'm sorry? Tell them we are people. people. Yeah. yeah. Right. And right. Well, well, is it just a prejudice of our generation of saying that? Yeah, when you got the thing, I remember the package, I said, a stack of them, of elements. Yeah, yes. I, I printed them. <laughs> yeah. um, was, nowadays, yes, there's a lot of information available, and there's a lot of disinformation right. available. Yeah. Right. And you're also receiving it, everybody's receiving it individually. Right. And exactly. I'm wondering if it's a prejudice of our generation that you aren't bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah that you don't have a real connection with the person who's the other end of what's coming into you. I mean, what, one of the things we did when we were starting how, you know, it, with the high schools in New York City to try to form is an, an organization is we would go to a high school with, uh, with uh, newsreel films. Yes. You know, and we, we would, you know, we would just, at, you know, at a church nearby or someone's house nearby and we would show a film and then talk about it with whatever kids showed up. And, and it was, I mean, like, yeah. yeah, hugely effective. Not not because of you not so much because of the particular quality of the information <coughs> in the films, but because of the, the shared experience. Right, because then people saw they were involved. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, I, well, I would say they're right. taking an armored slideshow to a, I mean, slideshows. We don't do those anymore. But it was the question and answering with the community. I I think the meal part of the mobile education project. Face but I liked the linking to Honeywell and um, you know Smith and Wesson and, and all of the companies because today's people know how to target the consumer, the the supplier, and um, we're familiar with that. Okay. One of the younger people had a question. Yeah, I have okay. a question for all of you. One of the things that troubles me um, in my education, we we learned almost nothing. One of the many wars, one of the many dates, um, and even when it came to more, more the wars of our time, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, there was no knowledge other than the people who were going out to war and coming back, and it was very much a, a stance of we don't talk about it. What do we do to kind of like? So there are lessons to definitely be learned here. I, I, the more I've heard, the more I'm interested. Where can young people like me and younger? Where can we find information that we can rely on? Because there is so much, and it's all being fed to us in this very, this very simplified, very bite-sized format. You know, where can we really dig in and get the real, you know, like really get invested in it? You're asking a really important question because when I, I went to Syria three years ago. My father had taught there, and um, you know, just before everything fell apart. Um, and one of the things that I, well, the reporters are embedded. I mean, there isn't the freedom of reporting. In Vietnam, you actually got to see the people that were affected. But in Syria, I watch the news, and I don't really see the people that are affected. And the, the factions are so complicated. Um, and so how to, I was saying when I was in Vietnam, I understood all the nuances and so on, but how am I gonna understand the nuances of the Middle East because no one's explaining it to me mm -hmm. through these vehicles that we created where you could go and you know, not document it. What was I don't think on. in Vietnam it, it wasn't. I don't think the average person understood the various well, sides right. in right. Vietnam. <laughs> you didn't get it right. there either. Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's, yeah. I would just like to ask Earl to share a little bit about your experiences of bringing your direct um, experience in Vietnam home to communities of Mennonites and others. I mean, and how you were able to make things real and understandable. Yeah, yeah uh, we, uh, my wife and I lived in Vietnam three years in the 60s and then went back in the 70s for a couple more years. At the end of those three years, we were so affected by what happened in the war that we came back um, and, you know, were railing against U.S. policy and so forth, all of which sounded very political to, to our friends and our churches and our parents, our families, and everybody. And so we 
said, whoa, this isn't communicating. And so that's when we said, hey, well, they didn't have the experiences that we had. They didn't walk through all of that. So that's when the story kind of emerged as the carrier for all of this. And so we really focused on just telling the story, you know, the slide sets and, and um, you know, having a guava bomb uh, that we carried around with us and, you know, an M79 grenade and told the stories of people affected. And um, so that became the, the motif. And then well, we were at Stanford a couple years uh, between those two terms in Vietnam. And there, too, we went around to high schools telling the stories and, and on campus uh, during the teach-ins. Uh, there were the political analysis people who gave all the talks about American foreign policy, but then the stories, they asked us to tell the story, and it was the story that often really carried the, uh, the, the, the freight, I think. Um, um, and, um, and then again, after the end of the war, writing the stories, um, and even today, just uh, a couple weeks ago, I was invited to our junior high school, our middle school, to talk together with a Vietnam vet, who's the head janitor of this school. And the two of us uh, spoke in an assembly, and both of us just told stories. Uh, and it was, Somehow, even in the story, even though he had a very different experience from mine, um, we were able to convey what the war was all about and also um, find respect for each other. Uh, he conferring respect on me and vice versa. Um, so that for us uh, was the, uh, the way of communication. I don't know how that uh, Translates it, it does translate really well, actually. I mean, we, we've known for a while that stories are, um, our, our whole thinking is in stories. We think of things in images and emotions. And that makes sense to kind of bring those stories, bring that reality uh, back to it. Mm -hmm. It's become so dry in school. All of history has become so dry. There's no substance. There's a wonderful documentary done in 1975 called Hearts and Minds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's available yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. Hearts and minds are mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really amazing and amazing. Yeah. You, you should Brennan see Jones, that. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Peter Davis made that. In fact, uh, he, they Peter made Davis. the Hearts and Minds, and I actually, uh, uh, actually, I, I got to meet with Peter Davis and so on, and, and tell him about all the Sly and Armored Sly shows, and he made another uh, show, made another show uh, that was very similar to the automated air war slideshow where he had Morley Safer walking into an appliance store and saying, this is a GE toaster, we think of them making, you know, bringing good things to life, but they make this weapon, do these things. He did something very similar to what we had, and CBS wouldn't show it. They, yeah. they uh, suppressed, censored it, and uh, uh, it never got out to the public, but, uh, and, and, but that was, that was a... Isn't CBS owned by... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, is that an AC? Yes. Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> 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 but, but with regard to the whole product, white product and product economics, I, I've never been a big fan. I mean, I, I remember we were boycotting Dow because of Napalm. And you know what? If Dow stopped making napalm, the United States government would find another company to make napalm if they wanted to make napalm. So it's about U.S. government policy, and that's really where I think it needs to be directed. If we're going to economically penalize a company, they'll find another company. Well, so, yeah, that, definitely, that's definitely the case. But the key was that this gave people a handle in their right. local community, yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Effect, and it make, and and, 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 and it makes it official. I mean, it has an effect on policy too. It, it affects um, you yeah. drastically. I still don't buy stuff. <laughs> yeah, going back to your, your your question and comment about about credibility and how do you get believable information? I think while that there's a, a plethora of misinformation out there today, thanks to the internet, the reality is it's always been there, and, and it's it, the misinformation and contradictions uh, and arguments are historic in every area. 
Uh, the thing that worked really well for the Indochina Mobile Education Project was that we had people traveling with the exhibit who, when they were challenged and said, you don't know what you're talking about, they could say, yes, I do know what I'm talking about. I have photographs of myself standing in front of the facility that I'm telling you about. And they were Quakers, Mennonites, um, IDS uh, people who would, had been in Vietnam. And at the time, there was a strong sense that the anti-war movement consisted of people like myself, who were long-haired hippies who got out of college and became draft resistors and had never been to Vietnam and didn't know what we were talking about. And we could counter that by saying, no, this is someone who has a religious background, went to Vietnam for strong moral reasons, and they can tell you their story. And, it's, and I'm sure there are people just like that today on any given issue, but having having face-to-face, -face, you know, let's sit down and share a meal and tell me your story, is pretty hard to refute. And uh, one of my concerns is that it seems to be harder and harder to send volunteers to some of the most, um, mm -hmm. um, most um, the most yeah. suffering conflict zones, um, and we yeah. know about it's, ISIS, of course. Yeah, drones don't tell stories. Drones, and um, I know the Mennonites, or Jean Stoltz, was, who had been a Mennonite volunteer, organized some, I, what was the name that he gave his group that he sent to Iraq? Um, Christian volunteers, or, do you remember that? I, you know, I heard him on the radio yeah. one day, on NPR, suddenly there's Jean Stoltz, who was 20 years after I'd worked with him for right. yeah. But, but then some of them got kidnapped, or yeah. had to leave, it, you know, it's just too dangerous to keep going on that scale. I have a good, very good yeah. friend who was with Mennonite Central Committee in Kurdish Iran just before the real invasion there, and it just turned out that his time was up. He was due to leave at the same time that it was getting really hard, and it was kind of a risky escape. And there was a couple of take his place, and I really don't know if they've been able to serve or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was, it was different. Yeah. I'm wondering how it is for you, Sophie, in the university now, uh, how you find mm -hmm. communication with students and uh, uh, well, um, what I tell people is that whenever I have vets in my classes, that they are the ones who are most interested in what happened in mm -hmm. Vietnam, and the ones who immediately understand what, what I'm talking about, and then I tell them about the ins and outs of U.S. policy, and how the communists reacted over the years. Um, uh, so that is something that's encouraging, but you hate to think that we have to make that mistake of sending young people to war before uh, the message comes back that yeah. it's not working very well. Uh, yeah, so um, I'd, I'd like to hear from Gary and David and Mai too about, um, well, especially you two were pretty much in the straight world, if we want to put it that way, <laughs> people who were um, associated with the war effort, but we were working with Rand, and did you feel that, that gave you more credibility when you came back to tell your stories, or? I mean, well, first of all, let, let me give a plug for my book. Yeah. Uh, not, not only her, her I think you, you're probably applauding for her wonderful family history, yeah, right. but I'm referring to another <laughs> book which she's written, which you should, all should read. Yeah. It's free and downloadable from the Rand Corporation's uh, site. It's uh, basically a history of Rand, uh, and its research uh, in, in Vietnam. You will be surprised to, to know that RAND was a pretty complex organization. Uh, and <clears throat> there was quite a diversity of uh, opinions, uh, reactions to the war, which are wonderfully chronicled by, uh, by Mai's, uh, Mai's book. And I think uh, that does, uh, as you uh, implied, Sophie, <clears throat> raised the question of how to reach people who are already inside the belly of the beast. Right? Uh, and uh, that in turn uh, raises a question which I, I think you suggested about uh, the responsibility of the anti-war movement uh, to be factual, uh, to be analytic, uh, to tell it straight, not to try to gild the lily <coughs> in order, which, which is a temptation 
the cause for mobilization work, um, dramatization is an essential part of the process. Uh, but it doesn't work when you're talking with people who are already inside the national security complex. Was, was that what you had in mind? Well, okay. My story that prompted the point is when I worked at Rampart, I worked for David Horowitz. Anybody want to groan? But this was before he turned, mm -hmm. and he'd written a book that was enormously influential when he was at the Russell Institute in the UK, of, uh, which was a the revisionist history of the Cold War. It's basically, it wasn't all the Russians. You know, we were we were making a lot of aggressive moves around the world, et cetera, et cetera. So the scales fell from my eyes. I was a disaffected college boy who struggled with the draft and um, was trying to figure it all out. I'd been a SNCC volunteer, but I had zero political consciousness. That was like an existential thing, a moral thing. And so I worked for Horowitz, and what we were after then, we did some good stuff about the involvement of foundations and the universities in the war as sort of an intellectual brain trust, Stanford's area studies program we got after them, uh, which was basically an intelligence service for uh, colonialism. And, um, and there was also a certain mode of doing research where first you decide what you want to say, and then you go out and get the stuff that you need to, to nail the bastards. And so that's kind of what we did. And, and, then, and we did a lot of you know, power structure research showing interconnections between corporates, who sits on whose board, and whose interests are where. We analyzed a lot of analysis at the Rockefeller banks and their positions in the State Department and whatnot. It's very useful information, some organizing potential around it. Um, but then, you know, David went south. He had some bad experiences with the, with the Panthers in East Bay. And, um, and he lost his faith. I guess he was rebelling against his parents, too. But um, <coughs> in, in the meantime, I recognized that a lot of the things that I'd gone out and found for him, I was his leg man. I'd go to the Cal Library and find documents that substantiated stuff that he wanted to say about the influence of, you know, Douglas Dillon and the, the <laughs> sorting out of the, of the um, Middle Eastern policy after the war and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, but, but some of it wasn't on, and some of it was misleading. And, uh, and by then I got in, so I was sensitive to that. And then I got involved in more activist stuff where we were also doing a lot of uh, use of information as an organizing tool in the Bay Area, fairly radical prison and war related. Um, organizing, and there, I started feeling the strictures of orthodoxy around the kinds of things. I mean, there were, there were things that you would read that didn't fit the narrative, but you could get, you could be ostracized for bringing up the wrong kind of information mm -hmm. in a collective that was bent on, you know, on agitation and action and, and whatnot, because we were small and battled. Uh, number and you have to stick together and it's a big threat to your ability to maintain an activist movement if you have questions that are being raised. Um, but in fact, I don't know, I, it didn't get settled. I eventually sort of bombed out of the whole situation because I felt like I was back in the same place I'd been in high school when that thing started to change for me when I started, I don't buy this story, you know, this is not, what about this, and what about this, with, you know, in terms of what the left's narrative was, what my narrative, what my people's narrative was. Um, so, that's why I brought it up. I wondered if other people had had similar experiences. I got into health policy here and during the Clinton period and so on, and I started looking at it, it learned some serious stuff. I started looking at what the single parent advocates are saying, and it basically, it's a, it's a conclusion around which evidence is marshaled, and, um, and there's. And I thought, like, no, you're putting your energies in the wrong places because you haven't nailed down the realities on the ground before you have picked your strategy in your mind and whatnot. And so I think it's a real danger if you, when you get into that sort of thing, and the, the, the fever of the moment reinforces all of those orthodoxies. Gary wants to come in on uh, Gareth Sorler. Thanks, yeah, I'm Gareth Porter, um, now independent investigative journalist and historian. And, uh, uh, and I've, I've worked on Vietnam, but also now on uh, US policy in the Middle East. 
And so I'm glad we're talking about narratives because that's really what I'm most interested in. I think there are two fundamental problems, there have been two fundamental problems with anti-war movement uh, and sort of capturing uh, an accurate narrative uh, and communicating that about Vietnam. And, and one problem is the one that we've just been talking about, which is you know, radical politics tends to put a straitjacket on analysis. And, and that straitjacket is you know, informed by Marxist um, analysis, which is economics you know, determine everything. Uh, economic interests of, of corporate America determines everything. Unfortunately, in the case of Vietnam, that analysis didn't really work because, I mean, you know, I mean, there, was, there were certain left uh, organizations that were promoting the idea that it was all about oil. <laughs> I don't know if I, many of you remember this, but you know, that, was a, that was a fairly popular thing on the left, that, uh, that the United States was intervening in Vietnam in order to grab the oil on the shore. Tungsten. Tungsten, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, were, there were ideas about that that were kind of pretty far out. And so, you know, the corporate, the corporate interest thing never worked on Vietnam, and it doesn't work to explain Iraq or Afghanistan or other policies the United States uh, has pursued, war policy the United States has pursued in the Middle East or South Asia either. Um, so so that's, that's one problem, and, and a, a second problem uh, w which I was more conscious of during the war is that there's a certain dialectic that takes place in uh, a war situation which is determined initially and primarily by the government's position about the narrative. And in the case of, of Vietnam, that narrative, the official narrative was, you know, the North uh, has sent their troops into the South and it's a North Vietnamese aggression. And the anti-war response to that, and I'm now talking about not you know left radical you know uh, sort of ideological left, but sort of the the movement of, uh, apart from that, was to say okay that's the official line. So so what actually happened must be that that this was uh, a liberation movement simply in the south, and uh, so so there was a, a whole you know response that that emphasized or. or made the argument that this was simply South Vietnamese. It was a civil war in the South. Mm -hmm. And of course, the reality was much more deeper than that, much more complex than that, or maybe not much more complex, but you know, the, the reality was that it was one country and one war, one struggle for uh, generations. And, and that, that was not getting through because of the working out of this dialectic where you know the official line sort of almost inevitably determines the response of the war movement. Uh, so and I was caught up in that to some extent, you know, uh, in, in an early period. Um, but but it, you know it became clear as I as I got into the details of the history that, that was that was a problem. And so I think there's, you know, broadly speaking, there's now a third, a third narrative that needs to be told, which explains Vietnam as well as Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is a narrative that has to do with the war state itself. But that's the problem. It's the national security state itself that is the problem. It's not, you know, it's, it's not the immediate interests of the corporations uh, you know, yes, the corporations are supporting the war uh, because it's specifically in their interest, but that's not the essence of the problem. The essence of the problem is a war state bureaucracy that, of course, generates you know allies in the private sector and they they form one system. But you know, from my point of view, that is what has been missing in the movement against uh, all of these wars is is the analysis that talks about the real fundamental issue, the fundamental problem. So that's what I want to spend the rest of my life on. I mean, I, you know, I've now written two books that have sort of, you know, in the process of doing those books, I learned that's, that's what the problem is. The first one being uh, the book that I wrote on, on how the United States became involved in Vietnam, uh, Perils of Dominance. And I didn't intend this to be the conclusion, but I realized uh, when I got into the documents, that 
But, you know, it wasn't JFK and LBJ who were the problem. It was the, you know, the CIA, the Pentagon, um, and the National Security Council, and the State Department, all of whom wanted that war. You know, I mean, they, they were all gung ho for war, and they insisted on it, and, they, and the presidents gave in, finally, to that pressure. Yeah. So, uh, and, and then, you know, that's, that's what happened on Afghanistan, certainly. It's certainly the Obama uh, uh, chapter of the Afghanistan war, when we upped the ante uh, uh, in a major way. And, and the war in Iraq lends itself to that analysis as well. Uh, so that's, that's what I think we really need to be moving towards. Yeah, it's interesting in the conference that we David and I and I just attended um, the Vietnam on the Vietnam War then and now. Um, one of the uh, analysts commented that it's not just that you have um, a specific goal that you need to implement, but you have national security professionals who have a thirst to prove their knowledge and their theories, and their, uh, I think somebody mentioned a thirst for activism on their part, yes. referring to yes. Henry yes. Kissinger and the Bundys, maybe. Do yeah. you um, want the new people to stand up? Yes, no, I do want them to introduce themselves. You guys at the back there. <laughs> My name is Paul Quinn Judge, with the Embassy in Vietnam. Uh, and I'm Leanne Tupacker, and I was with Dharmic, a National Action Research on Military Industrial Complex with the American Defense Service Committee. Okay, um, uh, there are a bunch of hands. I guess uh, Frank Joyce, would you talk Yeah, partly this is uh, uh, building on the last comment. Um, what are, there's a lot of valuable knowledge in this room about how to connect information to people, and I think we should really take note of that and build on it. The environment in which we do that is different, but some of the solutions are the same. What I mean by that is that uh, we really did bring information to people in an environment in which it was missing. Now the problem is more information overload and understanding and sorting through uh, the inundation uh, that surrounds us uh, all the time from a much more hostile media, by the way, that we face mainstream media now mm -hmm. than was the case then. A little digression on that. I mean, the, the Pentagon, the, we're here to figure out what the anti-war movement learned, if anything, uh, from Vietnam. The Pentagon clearly learned one thing, and that is uh, to improve their management of media uh, in how wars are portrayed and presented and explained to the American people. So, but I still think, you know, getting into churches, serving food, bringing information that has focus and meaning and content to the people we're trying to reach is critical. I say that in part to suggest this, and it's, it's an extension in part on Jura's uh, point. Uh, what, and the young man over there. It seems to me that what the American people understand the least at this point is not Iraq and not Afghanistan and not Angola and not Rwanda. They don't understand the United States. They don't understand our history. We are required to be constantly surprised when the same things keep happening over and over and over again. And that is partly, I mean, the miseducation and lack of information problem that we have is fundamentally a problem about the United States. Mm -hmm. And in that context, it seems to me that these methods and techniques of both analysis and research and presentation that we developed in the past are more relevant now than they were 40 years ago once we get some clarity. Just another sort of afterthought on that. Part of the reason that that you know, necessity is the mother of invention, uh, if there's a Madame Bin or a Ho Chi Minh in Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere, uh, I have yet to find them. And so we don't have that connection and that alliance and that relationship to those complex struggles that we did now. But we do have a relationship, as Tom and others were saying this morning, to an untold part of our own history. 
We have heroes. We have leaders. We have resistors. We have people whose stories are not being told to young people inside or outside of schools, or not young people either. So it seems to me there's actually quite a clear mission available here, and some pretty clear things to do about it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to point. say that we have about another five minutes, and <laughs> then we're supposed to, those having lunch are supposed to go upstairs, and those aren't, or not, or not. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I think that I, we can keep this discussion going if we want to keep lunch together. I think that would be very useful. But I, So now I think that I'd like to let a few people talk who haven't. And Linda, the R is one. Uh, thank you. I would just like to point out there are two different shifts in mentality that we're dealing with. Uh, first of all, uh, back in the day, the Vietnamese government always maintained a policy that was very clear and clearly stated that gave space to the American peace movement by saying that there was a distinction between the American people and the American government. Mm -hmm. That's not the case with ISIS or post 9-11. You know, now we're all targets. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's very hard to, to make that. The other thing is the mentality that, you know, uh, my age, um, you know, the kind of JFK generation, namely, uh, you know, Ask what you can, not what, you know, the, the quote, uh, kind of a benign sense that government was something basically good. And therefore, we were shocked to find out, shocked, shocked, <laughs> to find out that what government was doing in our name. Today, post Reagan, post, uh, you know, this whole idea of shrinking government until it can, you know, go down the bathtub. <laughs> um, you know, people have a much different idea, and so there's, as someone mentioned earlier, there's so much cynicism mm -hmm. that makes it more difficult to counter this national security state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, we have a challenge to go on telling the history of the Vietnam War accurately while working on the national security state and finding new ways to find eyewitness accounts that mm -hmm. will move people, I think, of, mm -hmm. regarding the current wars. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my obsession, is how to find those accounts that will move us and the Madame Bing or ordinary people, that we, we could just get to them somehow. Um, do, do you want to add anything about Norma? I know you've been thinking about this for a while. I, I'm sorry, because I, I don't know what's already been discussed, but I don't want to go through, um, you know, old ground. Um, and I was maybe, listening to other people. Maybe one them. thing you could tell us that hasn't been told yet was, remember when we made that alternate budget that looked like the military budget, and people took it into the procurement hearings? You remember that? Yes. You want to tell them about yes. that? I don't think you're aware of that. Well, you remember that? Yeah. Well, that was a joint effort. With IFP, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Could you stand up, please? Yeah, John. Jennifer, were you part of that? No, but I loved that work. I thought it was a brilliant piece. I just remember it very, very clearly, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know whose idea it was exactly. It might have been Fred. But the military used to come up with a very uh, clear document of re its request for military assistance and everything else. And somebody said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we took exactly that template uh, and say everything that was wrong with it in that, so that members of Congress, you know, they're so used to reading it in a government style, mm -hmm. and now they can see mm -hmm. an objection to it in exactly that format. <laughs> And that went over really well. Uh, and I have to say that we, we busted our guts out for that because it, we had a very uh, short time to turn around. Uh, we, it, it, the, the government issued their booklet, and so we had to prepare a pa uh, 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 the, our template in advance. You know, we didn't know exactly the numbers. So we basically had about 24 hours to stick in the numbers, you know, the latest numbers that the government requested, you know, rush it down to the printing press, you know, harass the printer, into the <laughs> and then so we came down, rush down to Washington. Maybe it was after, you know, with a whole bunch of and you know, taking it around to Congress. But I think part, maybe part of the lesson about that is 
understanding the language that the government speaks in and and and, and the people of power speak in mm -hmm. and because they may not hear our voices but they may hear voices that are more similar to theirs and so i think part of it was that we tried to make the effort to challenge them but in a way that they could hear us mm -hmm. you know um but I, I, I but i don't know about today but i i i think that the people today do that very well. I mean, I you know last last September, I, I joined this march in New York, and I think other people were in the climate change march. You know, it was huge all over the world. And usually, you know, our meetings are all of us, you know, white hair people. Mm -hmm. But that climate change march, you know, ran the gamut of generations, of races, of classes, mm -hmm. everything, and so. Somehow, and, and, and they also manage to speak to power in a way that is very effective. So I'm not so sure about whether we have something to teach them as much as we probably are, should, should communicate with each other because I think that there are lots of exciting things that they do and there's some things that we have done that might be interesting to them. Well, one other thing on that, that document with the Indochina Peace Campaign is that Congressman took it with him into the markup hearings. And, and uh, when, the, when, when Saigon rose, uh, you know, the ambassador said, we didn't just lose this on the ground. The uh, Indochina Peace Campaign, uh, uh, you know, and these three named civic groups that had actually cut off the funding of the war that he blamed it on. So it was very effective. <laughs> Can I just say yep, one last thing before we break for lunch? Um, you were talking about how to teach the, about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, I was privileged to be part of uh, uh, an effort actually spearheaded by a woman in California. Every summer she has a workshop for teachers mm -hmm. to teach about Vietnam and she would invite experts or so-called experts or people who know v about Vietnam and the Vietnam War to come and talk to the teachers. And they develop this whole, um, how would you call it, structure on how to teach the Vietnam War in a way that would appeal to students. So it's not just cut and dry dates and events, mm -hmm. but uh, interesting things like, for example, she would ask, uh, the teachers would ask the students to read an excerpt from my book, for example, because it's a family story. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for students to understand. And then ask them to write about what their family, um, how they, thought about the Vietnam War at the time, what, what events were happening at the time, and their family's reaction, things like that, and relate them, make it personal for them. So I, I don't think that all the, uh, all the uh, components of her program, but it sounds to me like it's something that would like appeal to students, because it's not cut and dry. Do you know what it's called? Uh, I can give you her name, and you can contact her. Okay, well, we've been officially requested to close our session. <laughs> it seems like we were just starting, but um, it's been a good beginning, I think. I just like to remind everybody of the showing the world is my country tomorrow at 1 at the FSC, just, uh, just uh, 10 minutes away from here. So, anybody else who needs a reminder? Uh,